I think all of us are interested in secrets. <laughs> At least I remember as a child that we always were trying to keep secrets from one another. And if somebody had a secret that somebody else didn't know, they thought, my, that's really worth knowing. The title of our message this morning suggests that there are some secrets involved in prayer. They're not really secrets, I guess, because if you call them secrets at all, they're open secrets. They're available to anyone who cares to look into the matter. But they may be secrets because many people haven't troubled to look into the matter very closely at times. Perhaps that's true of all of us at one time or another. As we think about our Christian faith, one of the things that to me has stood out as of great importance throughout the years is the fact of answered prayer. The fact that God does hear his children, that he does answer our prayers. I was reading a book about missionary work in China recently. I think I've mentioned it to several of you. One of the things that impressed the Chinese this would be about 150 years ago when the China Inland Mission started their work in the middle of interior of China where very few white people had ever been seen before. And of course, China is much in the news today because of the upheavals that are going on there. But this is before very much of Christianity was even known and none of it was known in the interior of China. One of the things that many of the Chinese were heard to say regarding the new religion as they considered it when Christianity was first brought to their attention was this, and the Chinese are very practical people. They said, these Christians, their God hears their prayers and answers them. And they seemed very surprised because they did not find that to be the case with their gods and goddesses of paganism. But prayer, like other things, has its right and its wrong ways of doing things. Some people may think of prayer as kind of a magical charm. You know, if you just say the right words and you say them with the proper intonation and so on, that that will get your prayers answered. And of course, those of you who have done some study into the matter and have found that God does answer prayer certainly know that that is not the case at all. It's not a matter of just certain words or certain tones or certain gestures or even a certain posture. Those things are not really essential. In fact, can be detracting to real prayer. The reason I've termed my message Seven Secrets of Prayer is that I find in this particular scripture lesson seven principles, we could call them secrets I suppose, that are very essential to prayer. Prayer that is, that will be heard and answered of our God. David of course is the writer of this particular psalm as we read in the heading. And as we think about David's life, recall some of the history that's given us in the books of Samuel and Kings. We re may recall that Samuel had a very rich prayer life, a very vital prayer life. He found that God was there with him to help him <clears throat> on many occasions in a very vital way. And so David is not giving us here <coughs> theories. He's not giving us uh, ideas that you might try out just for the sake of theory. But he's giving us tried and true principles that come out of the crucible of his own experience, of his own life. And therefore, we might call them tested and true that we can rely on. First of all, he starts out the psalm, Hear me, O Lord, and answer me, 
for I am poor and needy. He doesn't say, Lord, I've got everything solved. I know all the answers. Everything's in a neat bundle, and I'm on top of everything. But rather, he says, Lord, I'm poor and I'm needy. He comes to God in a very humble way. He's not self-sufficient. I believe that this is one of the very most important things in coming to God. We have got to recognize in our heart that we really need him. We can't go there to his presence and just feel that we've got it made and we know all the answers and we're very much able to take care of things. After all, why do we really go to him if that's what we think? And yet there are those who do. If we may believe the parable that Jesus told in Luke, the 18th chapter, <clears throat> beginning in, <clears throat> in verse 9, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Notice these people are pretty confident, pretty smug, they look down on everybody else. They think they're okay. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. What a good boy am I, we might add. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The second man recognizes his need. He had a great need. Jesus is not saying the tax collector is fine and that he has no need. What he is saying is that this man recognizes his need and owns up to it before God. Whereas the other man is so proud of himself and all his good deeds and all his righteousness that he brags. He tells God, oh, look what, what a good person I am. I'm doing all of these wonderful things. But the end result of both prayers is revealed in the next verse. I tell you that this man, that is the man who cried out to God for mercy, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Excuse me. Here then is the first principle or secret of successful prayer. Prayer that recognizes our need, that humbles oneself rather than exalts oneself. Prayer that realizes our need of God. One time I read, was reading something about President Abraham Lincoln. He's always been kind of one of my heroes uh, as a, a man, a man who had very humble origins, and yet a man who, because of his strong desire to excel, went on to become one of our greatest leaders, I'm sure, that we ever had in this nation. One time he wrote this out of the troubled times of the Civil War. He said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming convi conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed insufficient for that day. I think that reveals an attitude of recognition of need, this attitude that I'm talking about. Here is even the great president, we might say, a very wise man indeed, and a powerful man, recognizing he had nowhere else to go than to his knees before God. 
<clears throat> but the psalmist goes on. In verse 2 he says, Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. King James says, For I am holy. Not holier than thou, not that kind of holiness, but a holiness that has to do with devotion to God. He says, I've devoted my life to you. That's the kind of holiness he's talking about. Jesus once said, as we read in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew, the seventh chapter, <clears throat> verses 9 through 11, he's talking about our attitude before God. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him that knocks, it will be opened. The door will be opened. When we realize that we have a God who cares, can we not devote ourselves to him? If we realize that God takes that kind of a fatherly interest in us, his children, can we recognize the importance of living a holy life, a life that is devoted to him? In 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, one of the things that Paul says to this church at Corinth, and remember Corinth, there were a lot of problems in that church. Of all the churches that Paul wrote to, that one seems to have had the most spiritual problems. There was carnality there. There was idolatry even. There was lack of faith. Some of them even doubted the resurrection. He wrote to them about all these problems. And yet, in verse 2 of chapter 1, he calls them the church of God in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. Called to be holy. I would like to think that he is saying that to us today. To the church of God which is in Wenatchee, you are called to be holy. You are called to be devoted to God. Called to be set apart from the world and its sin to serve God and his Son. If we recognize that we are so called, then we can approach God with confidence in prayer. We can ask and expect to be answered. We can knock and expect the door to be opened. We can seek and expect to find if we set ourselves apart to serve the Lord. But even God's children sometimes don't seem to get answers to their prayers, and they wonder why. In 1 Peter 3, the Apostle Peter addresses that problem. Here he's talking about how husbands and wives deal with one another, living together as husband and wife. And he closes the section by saying, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. He talks to them about living with one another as heirs of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Sometimes our prayers can be hindered by the way we either devote ourselves to the Lord or fail to do so. He starts out by speaking to the wives as to their attitudes toward their husbands. And then he goes on and tells the husbands, about their attitude towards their wives. Now let's read that section. It's a very, very telling section, beginning in verse 1. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. 
Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women in the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. This, then, is a key, the way that we devote ourselves to God as husbands and wives and as children, too, in the family, will either help or hinder our prayers, depending on how we devote ourselves to the Lord. But going back again to the psalm, that same third ver or second verse, after he says, Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Here we come to a third ingredient, the ingredient of trust. The ingredient of trust. The word trust implies faith, confidence, resting in obedience to another, resting in trust, in believing. Not fear, but trusting in them. Let's look at a few verses regarding this. In the book of James, we have a very famous one that bears on this. <clears throat> Verses 5 through 7 of the first chapter. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Now, he's not simply talking about asking for wisdom, although he starts out that way, because he goes on to speak about asking for anything from the Lord. And he says, therefore, that if we ask, we must believe. We shouldn't just ask out of a sense of duty. You know, well, I ought to say my prayers now, so I'll say some prayers and I'll ask for so-and-so. Go through the list, you know. No, not at all. But because we believe that God will hear us and he will do what is needful in the case. He will answer our prayers. He may not answer it exactly in the way we may think, but he will answer it in a way that will be the best for all concerned. And we will know that he has done so if we ask in faith and believe. Uh, in our Sunday school period, we sang a chorus that brought out this same idea from 1 John 5, 14. These words that were set to music that we sang. He said, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. But notice he uses the word confidence. We have confidence in God. We trust Him. We believe in Him. We don't doubt Him. This is a key element in getting our prayers answered. Someone once said to another, my, prayer, my faith in prayer is shattered because my prayers seem to go unanswered. And his friend answered, well, is your, is your faith in prayer 
or is it in God? Is your faith in prayer or is it in God? There's a difference, a very important difference. Going back again to the psalm, we notice in verse 3 he says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. I call on you all day long, or daily, is what the King James puts it. Could be translated either way. But the implication is that I keep on. I don't stop. I don't leave it go at one time. Sometimes people have been confused because of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 of Matthew in verses 7 and 8. And I think we need to discuss this. King James says, use not vain repetitions. So some people think, well, that means I should only say it once and that's all. But I don't think Jesus is talking about that. I'd like to read it from the NIV. I think it's clearer. Verse 7, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. He's not talking about simply repeating a, a prayer because you are concerned about it. But he's talking about a babbling repetition of many words just for the sake of words. Again, that magical concept of prayer that says that if you just keep on saying certain words and say them often enough, God will have to answer your prayers. I think I mentioned that when I was down in Lima, I heard that someone had the radio on and they, it was coming from some uh, prayer meeting, I suppose they would consider it a prayer meeting. And all they were doing, hour after hour, and it kept on and finally turned it off, was saying the same words over and over and over again. Memorized, wrote words with the idea that if we say this enough times and in the right order of words, somehow God will perhaps answer. Maybe he'll get tired of hearing us and answer it for that reason. Over in Tibet and other countries there, they have the prayer wheel where the words are written out on a, on a wheel. And you just turn the wheel over and over and over again and those words are supposed to go up to the gods. You know, and just keep on saying or turning the prayer wheel. That is a tragic misunderstanding of prayer. But on the other hand, there is nothing wrong with continuing to pray the same prayer if that prayer is truly from the heart. Did we not read in the scriptures? Have you not read that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed the same prayer several times. Oh, my Father, if it be possible for this cup to pass from me, let it be so. It wasn't simply to say those words, but those words represented the cry of his heart. It was a repetition, but not a vain one. It was a very vital one. The Gospel of Luke has a great deal to say about prayer. We find more in that Gospel about it than any other, I believe. Here in Luke, the 18th chapter, Jesus tells about the widow, the persistent widow. In the NIV, it's called the parable of the persistent widow. When Je then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, a certain, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Notice, she kept coming. She didn't quit. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out 
whither coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? He implies that they keep on asking him the same thing. Not vainly, not simply to say a bunch of words, but they cry out to him nevertheless day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Implying maybe this faith, this kind of faith that continues to trust and believe and seek and implore God's help despite all obstacles. Do we have that kind of faith? That's the question that we must ask. And in the very same chapter, uh, he goes on, <clears throat> or is it in the same chapter? Maybe I'm wrong here. The, chap the, the story of the uh, man who went to his friend at midnight and asked for some loaves of bread, you remember? And the Lord said the man finally got up to give him what he asked, not because he was his friend, but because of the importunity or the boldness of this particular man who asked for help. So again, we ask the question, are we willing to care enough about our prayer requests that we keep on asking God until we get some answer that lets us know what his will is, at least, for us in the, re in the particular matter of that request. So we have the prayer of the song, Keep on Praying. Keep on praying, even when things look as though our prayer is not going to be answered. Keep on praying. Keep on asking God. Keep on knocking. In fact, in that passage in Matthew 7, where Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given. Actually, the Greek tense is keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. It's that present imperative. It implies that we don't give up on the Lord. Going back again to the psalm, Psalm 86, in verse 4 he says, Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. He seems to imply, I'm not just telling you what I want with my mouth, but I lift up my very being, my soul, my very being, to you. It implies that caring enough to really put our whole heart into it. Put our whole heart. In Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, I think we have a further word regarding this that's very good. In verse 13, God is saying to the people, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you seek me with all your heart, not simply with all your mouth, but with all your heart. Again, it's the matter of the heart. What is, what is in our prayer? How much do we put ourselves into our prayers? Are they just perfunctory little nice prayers? Or is there really heartfelt meaning before the Lord. I think that is what we must recognize that the Lord is looking for. In Psalm 63, we have a further testimony regarding this. <clears throat> psalm 63, the first verse of the psalm. He says, O oh God, I, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. David again wrote this, you'll notice. 
And he says he's seeking God earnestly. He says, I'm like a man in a desert that's thirsty. It's dry, and I'm really thirsty. He says, but I'm really thirsty for you. I'm really hungry for you. He says, even my body is longing for you. He feels it so strongly that he just, his whole being, his whole person is crying out for God. If we have that experience in our prayer lives, I believe that we will find more answers to prayer than we've ever had before. If we really throw our whole heart and soul into it. Of course, the famous scripture in Hebrews 11 that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, not simply perfunctorily or out of a sense of duty, seek him, but who diligently, with all effort, with every effort, seek him, then he will reward such seekers. What about the sixth secret of prayer? In verse 5 he says, you are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call on you. You are abounding in love. He recognizes from his past experience what God is like. When we can start having experiences of God's love, that will give us further faith to trust him in the coming experiences. Every experience of answered prayer is something to build upon for future answered prayer. We are building a life of prayer and experience with God. It's interesting what David replied when he was going to go out against the giant Goliath. I'd like to look with you for a moment at a moment for or with that, or at that experience, <clears throat> when Saul objected that, that David was really not able as a young man to fight this great giant, I'd like you to notice what David replies, beginning in verse 34, when, when Saul said, well, you're just a boy, and he's been a fighting man for all these years. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep, when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defi defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. In other words, David is saying, I've already had experience of how God will protect and take care of me. Should I not then trust that he will help me against Goliath? He is drawing on past experience as he answers the objection of the king before him. And the final answer, the final secret that I see here is found in verse 7 where he says, <clears throat> In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. You will. This will is assurance. He is so assured that he is saying to God, I know you will. I know you will answer me. He's not saying, I think you will. Not even, I trust you will. But in fact, he says, I know you will. I know you will do it. I trust so much that it has become a matter of assurance with me. Reminds me of Martha when Jesus came after Lazarus had died. And Jesus was talking with the sisters, talked with Mary and with Martha, first with Martha. And even Martha said something that I think is worth looking at. Martha, who 
did not get quite the commendation that Mary did. But in verse 21, Martha says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. We really shouldn't downgrade Martha, even though on that one occasion, Jesus did have to uh, reproach her a little bit, because Martha really did have a strong faith. She says, Lord, I know that if you'd been here when Lazarus was sick, he wouldn't have died. You would have healed him. But even now, is she not saying, kind of veiled, she says, I know whatever you'll ask, he'll give you. To the point even, I think she's hinting, even if you raise him, if you ask God to raise him from the dead, he will. I know he will. I know this, says Martha. Do we know that God will answer our prayers? Do we know it? Sometimes we hear children pray, and they have no doubt. They just pray and, and unselfconsciously ask God for things that we adults are kind of afraid. We, oh, I don't know whether they should pray that or not, you know. But that's how children will pray, with not with assurance that God will answer them. And he does, many times. These, then, it seems to me, are seven of the great secrets of prayer that are found in this particular psalm. It isn't everything that we could look at by any means. But these are some of the things that are very important that I would invite you to try out, to test. You know, the proof is in the pudding, as we say. Look at this psalm. Look at it again. Read it again for yourself. Consider those principles that David is expressing here in his relationship with God and what he is seeking to share with us as he expresses those seven secrets of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you now for the privilege of prayer, for the opportunity of learning in your school of prayer that you are a great prayer hearing and answering God. Father, we pray that you'll go with us now from this service, guide and direct us, keep us and use us to your glory, that we may be faithful in all things, that we may show forth the precious truth of your love and of your son and his salvation. We ask this, Father, in the name of your Son, who died for us and who is alive forevermore, that we might walk in his ways. Through him we pray.